Welcome to the latest edition of Broadcasting Today, where we'll be talking to Kim Catterside, a former BBC correspondent and now responsible for PR, lately for the inquest into the death of Mark Duggan, and Taki Suleiman, who runs the Press and Communications Department of a London local authority. It's all part of our mission to encourage students how to think critically, but also how to do. Welcome to the, another version of Broadcasting Today. And tonight we'll be talking to Kim Catcherside from Champollion and Taki Suleiman, who is the Press and Communications Lead at Tower Hamlets Council, all part of our mission here at Middlesex University London to get students to engage in critical thinking, but also to make sure they know how to do it right. Kim, first, welcome. And I wanted to first to ask you about your move from broadcasting to PR, sort of gamekeeper to poacher, poacher to gamekeeper type of question. What made you do it? Well, you want the, 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 I suppose you want the truth. Um, uh, Naturally. <laughs> truth is always a good idea. Um, well, you tend to reach a certain age at the BBC and um, you're um, uh, made the offer that you can't refuse and you're expect, you, know, you, you know it's going to be made at a certain stage because it's just, that's what happens. And so you always think, you're thinking generally uh, about what it is you want to do next, um, uh, at least a couple of years before you do. And I'd always want, wanted to have another career after the BBC. I mean, after all, uh, 25 years doing any one thing, however interesting, is probably quite long enough. And uh, I, uh, I wanted to go into the third sector, so into charities or into education, which was the sector that I covered as a correspondent. Um, and then you sort of think about, well, what do my skills match? Uh, and really, when it gets to that stage, you've got to pay the bills, so you, you can't sort of start at the floor somewhere. You have got to go, it, go in at a reasonably high level, and you need to think um, pragmatically about what transferable skills you've got, and that naturally means communications. So when Nick Davis talks about Flat Earth News, and he talks about journalism, when we started 25 years ago, there are very certain ideas about what journalism should be, could be, would be. And Nick Davis then did this research with Cardiff University. He said, well, the, one of the problems in the last 10, 15 years is that PR has got in the way of journalism. You must have been aware of the conversation before you went into PR. How do you match that up with your 25 years of experience at the coalface of real hardcore journalism? You were a top BBC correspondent. You know, I think that's a bit of a cop out to the idea that PR has got in the way of journalism. Uh, journalists have a job to do, and that involves um, uh, applying analysis and your critical fa faculties to the information. Uh, and that applies no matter what the information that you are given. And if you know they've, that you know, the PR has been involved, then you, you have to factor that in. But what I find increasingly, and this isn't necessarily a good thing, that as news organisations are expecting uh, fewer and fewer people to do more work, if anything, that they actually need public relations organisations in order to help them to uh, get the information out uh, cleanly and quickly. In fact, it was actually said to me um, by a major national newspaper that I uh, have done some work with, I don't do any more because I haven't got time. But I was doing some work for this major national newspaper for their online outlets. And it was said to me, well, it's great. You know, you're a, you're a new kind of journalist. Um, and the new kind of journalist was essentially, oh, well, no, actually, just to, to replay the conversation a bit, earlier in the conversation, uh, we were talking about my role at Champollion and PR. And this person said, well, you know, we need the PR, PR organizations because because otherwise, um, the stuff that we get from the people that we're trying to 
uh, put into the news would be so garbled that we wouldn't have time to uh, we wouldn't have time to clean it up. You clean up the stories for us is essentially what she was saying. So uh, that's not necessarily a good thing, but I wouldn't say that that's getting in the way of the news. Well, that's defining the agenda one step before you get to the journalist, is it not? Well, I mean, it's. It, um, I suppose it's it's the world we live in. If uh, if if news organisations are investing fewer and uh, less and less money in actually uh, enabling people to do the research and do the work from um, from from basics, then you do need some layer of interpretation, and that does bring dangers. Of course, it brings dangers. Um, it doesn't, in the end, I think mean that the journalist doesn't have a responsibility to factor all that in and apply some critical thinking. But then their managers also have a responsibility to ensure that they do actually have the space to do that. Of course, at Tower Hamlets, Tacky, you don't do PR, you do it yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tower Hamlets has been right at the rough end of many a news story the last few years since your elected mayor who came into office, uh, Ludwig Wackmann. Um, lots of journalists have taken a heavy dislike to him. How do you manage that from a press and communications point of view? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I mean, I take everything that, that Kim has, says and I add another layer of, of analysis. And, I, and what I say is it depends on who's writing the news, who's producing the news, who's broadcasting the news. For me, the BBC, and I'm not sucking up to you there, Kurt, or to you, Kim, is a bastion of Why truth. Not? Well, it's a bastion of truth. <laughs> For me, when all the time the right wing meet, the right wing press, the Express, the Mail, all that lot were pushing out their narrative. For them, look for Rahman was an Islamist. Um, I was walking to the pub with a, a friend of mine. I was saying to him, he's a producer, and he was saying to me, um, you know, hey, you've got a new job. Where are you going? I said, I'm going to Tamlis. He goes, no, a friend of mine's a producer of the Dispatches program, and um, he's an Islamist. I was like, he's not an Islamist. He's an ordinary guy who happens to represent his community, and this kind of narrative was building up, and so. What I say is if it wasn't for PR, of different types of PR, um, and, I, and in my case it's local authority PR, um, we try to put out a different story. Now, we're not allowed by law to promote a politician, but what we are allowed to do is to promote community integration, to promote participation in democracy. And that's what we do um, with Look for Rahman, for instance, and we position him as a leader of the community, a spokesperson. And indeed, he's, he's um, Britain's first Muslim mayor. So that was extremely difficult. Uh, the Standard last year also wanted to do a number on, on Lutfi Rahman and his administration, and indeed wanted to depress, in my personal opinion, um, turnout in our borough. And the way we got around it was, and the story was, that there was widespread fraud, electoral fraud, in the borough. By the time you investigate that fraud, a year and a half later, the damage has been done. So how do you correct it? Well, you use broadcast. You bring the broadcasters in, and you and I at the time, uh, we did a piece, and your requirements that you had untrammeled access to behind the scenes, and that's what we got. So the standard, with its one and a half million readers in the commuter belt, or BBC TV London, with its one and a half million viewers in London. And for me, that's how we counteracted that story. And, uh, and that was really... It made our staff feel good. It made the people in the borough feel good. They didn't feel there was widespread um, electoral fraud, for instance. So there's a massive challenge. I think there's, for me, there's an issue about ownership of media. Um, and I look to the BBC, and that's why Savile was such a, a serious breach of trust. Um, I look to the BBC as a bastion of uh, telling the truth. And I, will, I, I know I will get a hearing when I speak to a journalist. How important is it for you to get that counter-narrative right centre compared to this dominant narrative which tends to emasculate mm. all in its path? Mm. Now there's a question. Um, I, I, there's a number of different levels on that. I mean, you wouldn't do it in a way that's so front and centre. You would position little stories, for instance. So the story might well be um, the imam at East London Mosque, for instance, who is running a course on counter-terrorism. Um, you, you find people who break the, the mould. Um, and actually, it turns out to be the vast majority uh, of the people who break that mould. And as we saw on Friday, 
Um, there was a small group of people trying to ban alcohol on Brick Lane. Uh, I wish them luck with that one because that ain't going to happen. Um, <laughs> and there were six, you know, motley crew walking down the street, um, handing out leaflets, surrounded by, you know, a hundred police and uh, people in the restaurants, you know, Bengali shouting at them, "Go away! We don't want you here." Um, so you highlight that type of. Um, contrast and tension you try to give the, the debate the narrative different flavors you, instead of it being black and white you show the different layers in an argument and I think broadcast can do it um, in a way that sometimes print can't print these days because it doesn't have the news gathering resources in my opinion is moving more into the world of comment it's entertainment uh, perhaps it's moving back to its roots as coffee house gossip yeah absolutely. <laughs> I mean the coffee house gossip, presumably, that is not in the interest of the clients who you are there to support. They want serious issues debated in public forums like the BBC or the newspapers at a serious level. It provides an opportunity, actually, oddly enough. Um, and I think, you know, what, I, mean, it, I, I think that um, where Taki and I um, are in PR terms. I mean, the, the, the organisations that, that my small firm represents, for instance, are charities, education organisations in the main. Um, it's, it's sort of slightly different from BP and the banks and things like that. So, I mean, uh, uh, who actually have an awful lot more money to spend. But uh, the, what you call the sort of comment, the, the entertainment, the chat, that does provide a, a big opportunity for organisations because that's one of the things that my uh, firm specialises in doing, which is what we call building people as commentators. I mean, you can, uh, uh, with uh, sustained and imaginative intervention, I think is the PR speak for this, um, actually build someone from nothing to someone. Uh, we have a, uh, we don't have very many commercial clients, but, um, uh, and oddly enough, they're the worst payers, I don't know why, and they... <laughs> We, see, we let them get away with murder. Um, and uh, anyway, we've got a, a client who's a small housing organisation. And um, this was sort of literally two man and a dog, this, this organisation, until quite recently when they got a big um, London grant. Um, but this chap was, um, was in the newspapers every week. He was appearing on the, um, on the budget panels for the BBC, simply because we did the job of reading the newspapers every day, um, sorting out what he had to say and how he would say it. And uh, whenever uh, there was an issue that came up, get on the phone, um, uh, we've got so-and-so, he'll say X, Y, Z, do you want him on the show? Um, we, uh, there's, an, there's an article running on housing. Um, uh, we'll, can we get a letter to the editor in? We write three paragraphs, get it in before one o'clock. That sort of thing over a long period of time builds and actually that is a very very good way of building the profile of a client so you can actually use that to your advantage because um you know because you, it's literally a way of saying absolutely nothing <laughs> you know if, if clients have got no stories that's uh, that's that's a way of um of getting them getting their profile raised. But you're also at the serious end, aren't you? Because let's be honest, you have been instrumental in making sure in the Mark Duggan inquest that that has been run in a way where journalists can do their job effectively when they come into the High Court to hear the evidence. You provide them with information that can help them tell that story and keep that story in the public domain. And for the fair administration of justice, one could argue that's a key role. So it's not just getting... No, it excellent. isn't. And I, and I feel really privileged to have been able to do this, actually, because um, it's a very, very sort of new thing that we've been able to do. And it's, it's relatively simple. Um, uh, the, the, the inquest team is a very small team of, what, maybe five people. And their job really is to, uh, is to gather together a room full of evidence um, and uh, bring to light the facts around the death of Mark Duggan. That's what they're paid to do. They're not paid to answer the inquiries of anything up to sort of 50 to 100 reporters who are quite rightly interested in, in, in the whole process. And it's very, very important, and yet, and yet they recognised the supreme importance of showing that this was an independent and transparent process. 
um, to have done anything else would have brought the whole process into disrepute. But at the same time, their lawyers, you know, whatever, however many hundred pounds they're paid an hour, shouldn't really be spend, spent answering press inquiries. So we've done that and um, uh, uh, on the one hand sort of taught them how to release the information faster than they might otherwise have done. Mm -hmm. um, but also I think at the outset um, did our best to explain the process that this, you know, that, that what an inquest was, how it differed from a, a criminal process and to try to b build confidence in a process um, of, uh, well, in the inquest, which is particularly important, especially in the light of, uh, I mean, the, the, what, what's happened over the last two years with various other organisations. Taki, of course, you were a politician. Um, in fact, our first encounter was me grilling you over the death of Victoria Climbier. Um, I don't think it was a particularly pleasant experience, from what it's I recall for you. Yes. Uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> as a first day in the job, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> as a politician, how much has that informed what you now do, advising elected politicians in how they deal with the media? Uh, uh, there's a couple of things. I mean, first off. Um, I was not comfortable in that interview and uh, I didn't really answer your questions. Then that was the point. So one of the, f the first things I think you taught me, Kurt, was to answer the question. You may want to move into another direction to, to add and to bridge, um, but you've got to answer the interviewer's question. It looks strange if you don't answer the question. It looks shifty. Um, and on camera at that age, I looked very, very young and it didn't come across well. You didn't so, go and advise New Labour the same way, though? Uh, no. <laughs> And so, I mean, what I did is I, I used that, I still got that uh, cover of that tape, I use that tape, I show that tape, and that's an example of not how to do an interview. Um, but, you know, I progressed, and uh, as the Victoria Columbia story unfolded and moved to the inquiry phase, um, I, I fielded more interviews, and I felt comfortable with the subject matter, and I suppose that's led me to where I am now with public sector communications, which is actually we're here to tell the truth. We have a, a duty to tell the truth. And sometimes, obviously, there's different interpretations of the truth. And it's a subjective analysis. So I feel very confident in what we're doing. And so when I come across a politician, for instance, who is nervous and is worried about how they might come across on camera, well, what is it they're nervous about? Are they worried about how they're going to sound? Are they worried about getting their story across? And so what I do is I say, listen to the question, think about why you came into politics in the first place, and just tell your story, and tell it with a passion um, that first drove you to go into politics in the first place. I'm interested you say that the objective is to explore the truth. <laughs> because from a journalist's point of view, <laughs> the last thing you seem to get from many a press and communications department is an attempt to help broker the truth. It's normally like a brick wall you're trying to batter through in order to get to the truth of the story as you understand it. It's, it's not a facilitative role that you but, seem but to here's, be But here's suggesting. the thing. It, the truth will out anyway. In this um, era of you know, data transmission, you know, kept on computers forever, record keeping, data protection, um, FOIs, the, the truth will always out. And we don't quite have the American system where you, know, you can get an administration's entire uh, goings on you know, 10 years later. Um, but we're heading in that arena. And, for instance, I interpret uh, the FOI rules in a way that it was total transparency. So when I do, for instance, a year and a half ago, um, or two years ago, I planned our Olympics response um, and how we're going to both promote, protect and promote the reputation of Tower Hamlets, uh, both locally in London and across the globe. And I wrote the communication strategy in such a way that it was going to be accessible to the public and people were going to FOI um, that document. So for me, it is about telling the truth. Now, I'm not going to give you information that you don't know, um, but if you were to come knocking and asking a prescient question, I would, um, I would tell you the truth. Yeah, so this, is, I mean, this comes back <laughs> to my point about the importance of journalism. You need to ask the questions, and you need to think of the questions to ask, and you need to be... Um, have the time, um, uh, you know, and the imagination to uh, to think about what questions that you need to ask. Do you worry? You alluded to at the beginning of your observations that 
there isn't enough time for many journalists now. In fact, they're almost delegating the responsibility to you. And as long as you give them a clean copy, they'll publish it, which actually defeats the purpose of journalism in serving the public. Are you thinking about the public more than them? Or are you just thinking about your client? Well, I'm only four years out of journalism. I was, um, you know, a journalist for quite a long time. Um, you know, it's, uh, I still think of myself and describe myself actually as a journalist. So maybe you better ask that question. <laughs> 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 no, I, think, I, think, I think both are true. You know, when, I mean, uh, 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 people are under pressure. Uh, there, uh, there are, uh, for instance, in, in my own sector in, in education, I saw um, newspapers that used to have um, three people come down to a very, very vexed and harassed one at the same time that they're actually producing, I think, if anything, more copy. Mm. And, you know, with digital um, demands, you know, it's not one deadline a day. It's, mm. it's, it, it's constant. Um, uh, so, you know, so there are those demands. I mean, very often, uh, you know that goes two ways. It's um, uh, they're they're only really interested in the strong stories, so you have got to have a story to yeah. give them, um, uh, because you know, they just don't have the time to waste. Do you need journalists? Do you need journalists? They're only human. I mean, yes. well, do, do, yes. do you need journalists anymore? I mean, now there's all this digital platform, digital transformations. You could do you, you're churning out the copy yourself. So why do you need the journalists? You need people to get the facts out there as they are observed. And yes, you can overlay the comment later. Comment is, is easy. Um, uh, you know, forgive me putting it like that. I, I think it is, it's an easier thing to do to have an opinion. It's terribly hard and time consuming. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's very expensive. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I, I, I'm interested in news gathering because I think with news and things that happen in a locality, I mean, the borough I represent is, is the East End. Um, it's a, you know, a place of, of social reform and has been um, for 100 years or so and more. Um, and I, I, it's important to get that story across. And I think when it hits with a running story, um, then we are successful. But I think you do need journalists. Um, there are organisations, if you believe in a bureaucratic self-interest model, to go back to my uh, <laughs> academic days, um, organisations can have a tendency to protect themselves. And so sometimes they will try to keep information back that actually their mistake, it would be useful to no for other people and so journalists are very useful to spot corruption uh, to spot you know wrongdoing mistakes and spread learning and, no, I and agree with that but are they useful for you in what <laughs> you've got to do or can you simply bypass them no, absolutely. No. I mean, we need journalists. I mean, I, I, I sort of worry about, um, about there being fewer news outlets. I mean, particularly, I mean, we're, we're aimed at the serious press, um, our sorts of PR. I mean, we, we, you know, that, that's what we require. Um, you know, it, it, it hugely concerns me that a, 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 that, a, that a newspaper like The Times, for instance, might be forced to close or you know the Guardian there was much talk of the Guardian being in financial trouble that's sort of gone away but it keeps coming back again because I mean it is making vast losses um, if uh, if you lose big outlets like that mm -hmm. then um, you know from a purely selfish point of view I've got far fewer places to put my news out to and my comment and uh, and, and all that sort of thing but uh, uh, you know, those organisations, as journalists, do do a lot of good. I mean, th they have campaigns. I mean, think of the, mm. the Times' c cycling campaign, which, you know, literally created um, interest and, uh, uh, and political interest and priority and something that really nobody gave, um, uh, you know, cared about at all before. Um, the Standard, similarly, with its, um, with its reading campaign, mm -hmm. um, the, it was the... Um, the Dispossessed. Was another one that they yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it was the Times who also did the um, uh, the child prostitutes story. Oh yes, that's right in Rochdale, which they pushed yeah. very strongly. Yeah. Um, which I mean, I remember I did that. 1997, mm -hmm. I did my first story on um, on child prostitution in Rochdale. I mean, this is exactly the same story, and I've I've done that sort of, you know, uh, I mean, on a fairly regular basis. But by regular, I mean about you know once a year or two, because. Um, the BBC doesn't do campaigns. This is where I think the newspapers are fantastic. Uh, and so 
uh, it was quite difficult for me to do that story over and over again. A, a complete scandal which has been going, go, going on and on. And, you know, the Mail has its campaigns, even the Mail. Indeed. But, I mean, you talk about content and the role of PR. I mean, I went into PR in, when was it, 1997. Um, and, uh, you know, I, in my first weekend, in a, the 13th largest PR company, as it as was, a company called Basham & Coyle, a guy called Brian Basham. Uh, those people who know about uh, the history of PR in this country uh, will know about this guy and his involvement with British Airways and Virgin as the PR. Uh, I'll, I'll say no more in case this is going to be recorded and put out. Uh, of course it is. It is being recorded. Indeed, exactly. Yes, I'm already so, uh, worried. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> watching out for the lawyers. He has very well-paid lawyers out there. Um, but the point being is that I was shocked in this small PR company. It was a, it was a business um, in a financial PR company. And I looked at the business press that weekend and there were 15 or 16 stories uh, from this one little company. And we had 10 employees. And I was imagining, you know, what, what, what would have been, you know, the, the road and ruds of this world um, and the financial dynamics and uh, the Edelmans and the Hill and Nolton, Noltons. So if you overlaid all their work, I mean, that raises a fundamental question about transparency and about who runs our financial markets. I mean, I, for me, that was worrying. Um, I did stay six years, so obviously I wasn't that worried. Um, but it, uh, it, I think that was a little bit corrosive, actually, um, on the fabric of, of the way the markets in this country work. Um, but you do need PR firms, I think, to find stories. And sometimes I come across journalists who are, are grateful. And if you chime with somebody who's already looking in that angle anyway, or that subject matter, then it can be mutually beneficial. If you're, you were starting again right at the beginning, would you see PR and communications as an alternative pathway to journalism? Knowing what you now know four years after your well, no, I mean, I, I, don't, I can't. You can't ask me to regret what I did because no, I really, really regretting. enjoyed it. I'm thinking of the students of <laughs> mm. now, when they think about the spectrum of possibilities. When when I graduated, PR and communications was quite a way down the list of possibilities. Whereas it seems to me things have changed so much. PR has become so much more vigorous that actually PR and communications is not in quite the same category as it was 30 years ago. I think, I mean, if you, if you um, it's very creative PR, which is, um, which is something that people don't, it doesn't occur to you necessarily. Um, so for instance, you've got um, uh, small organizations who, from our point of view, have got small organizations, haven't got much money. Um, uh, it, 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 it can be quite difficult to find stories to explain, to, you know, to transmit their messages. Sorry, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm, I'm going back into <laughs> PR speak. But they, you know, they have things to say about themselves. And it can be a bit difficult to get those, the, the stories that help them to say what they want to say. So it is the job of, um, of, of a PR person, essentially, to think of lots and lots of different creative ways to say that one thing. An organisation really has only got one message, that, uh, well, or a series of subsets of messages that it has to say about itself. So you have to think of imaginative ways to say the same thing over and over again. And so we often have sort of brainstorms about, I don't know, um, uh, ideas of, uh, of ways that we can get those messages over. And we had one for um, City Bridge Trust recently. Um, well, it wasn't that recently, but uh, it was um, about a philanthropy exhibition that the um, City Bridge Trust were promoting. So how do you promote the idea of philanthropy and the philanthropy exhibition? And we had ideas like um, uh, uh, have a, uh, a sort of a map of the whole of London and um, take out all the buildings that, um, uh, that, that wouldn't be there if it hadn't been for philanthropy, for instance, that sort of thing. So some mm. kind of a, uh, a visual rep mm. representation of that. Um, uh, we had an, actually, it was another thing for um, CBT. Uh, no, it wasn't, it was the Science for the Future. Science for the Future. I mean, uh, they were uh, a load of um, professors who were upset, upset about the way that the government was spending research funding, basically. Oh, um, and so, I mean, it's a bit of an obvious idea. I had this idea where we would have an East End fu funeral. So we had the, the horses, you know, it's the petition to Downing Street. Or Barbara Windsor. 
it was it was it was that sort of thing. We could if we could have afforded her, we would have we would have done. But we, you know the hearse, the you know the um, save British science in white carnations down the side, the you know the top hats and everything went round Westminster, um, uh, you know to Westminster Square four times. Um, trooped up as close to Downing Street as we could possibly get it. Got it on the local news. Lots. It was a great photo story. So um, you, uh, it, it's your job really to think of creative ideas like that to get people in the news. Absolutely. And uh, I was going to add that um, I've put in sort of the performance and development review of all my team. Uh, they have to come up with one production um, that has to be produced by a TV company each year and we're now they're so successful at it we're now in discussions with 14 and uh, <laughs> I'm trying to tell them to, to, to back off I mean we had how to get a council house um, was on um, Channel 4 recently and that was really good um, so but it's, it's very creative they have to think about the subject matter um, almost as much as and I think Kurt's right when you say that back in the day it was <sighs> PRs would, would deem to be a little bit dizzy a little bit Dim. Um, and you know, I've got a master's in social policy, and I pride myself on being able to understand the policy and to work with the people who deliver the services that my council delivers. And if you can sit alongside those very highly skilled individuals, um, then actually you can produce some really good stories because they don't necessarily think that they're sitting on good stories. I and mean, that's why the PR is yeah, yeah. needed. I mean, it's about, yeah, I mean, you have to have the facility to spot the story, but also, particularly in the area of social policy. Um, in order to have credibility both with the client and the journalist, you have to know your social policy. Um, so, you know, it's a, you've, you've, you, 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 I mean, it's, it, you, you have to um, have a lot of depth as, uh, as well as creativity. So I think it's, it's definitely a career well worth considering. Do you think that the relationship between PR and journalism can help public policy, politics, justice, all those things which traditionally journalism has been um, targeted with probing the inquiry of journalism into those big affairs of state. Do you think that PR and journalists together can enhance that discourse? Or is there a danger, as, as uh, uh, Nick Davis that, would say, that actually that's just it's the wrong people getting into bed with each other? It's, I suppose I'll answer that in this way and say that if it becomes too cosy and if it becomes too much like checkbook uh, PR and journalism, then the original intents of, of both uh, will be eroded. Um, and for that, you need a plurality of media ownership. Um, for that, you need checks and balances. Now, I remember reading in Leveson, he was saying, um, Lord Justice Leveson was saying that this is the eighth investigation into the conduct of, of the press and the media um, over the last 70 years. Um, I think you need a strong public sector um, broadcaster. I think you need press regulation. Um, and I think you need a profession like PR, which is open and transparent. And he says that. I'm, I'm not a member of uh, the CIPR, um, even though I've spoken at some of their, their courses. But the point is, you do need a professional body. And I think it should always be made a requirement to be in my profession and have that, that set of ethics. So, for instance, I was speaking to a freelancer on um, an investigative journalism program. It's current, it's live, and it's a big issue, so I won't name it. Um, but the individual had not yet been commissioned. So I was saying to him, well, look, I don't want to speak to you just yet um, because under what guise are you being controlled? Who can I complain to if I don't like the way you're operating? Mm. Um, you know, if you're working for Channel 4 or the BBC, then I know the framework that you're existing within. If there's a framework like that, then I think there can be a mutually... It will never be a trusting relationship, let's be honest, and why should it be? But it can be supporting in some ways and beneficial in some ways. Let's have some questions from the... I just want to chime in on that, that. I mean, just briefly. Yeah. I mean, I mean well, uh, OK, so um, PR is a, is a useful translation. Um, it's a facilitator, uh, and, and, in, in, and in that way it can be useful for journalists. But journalists should never, ever forget that these are vested interests, and that's the, the job of the journalist, to, to, to bear that in mind and factor it in to uh, the way that they handle that relationship. But no doubt you'll remind them. <laughs> Well, uh, do I remind them? I think they, I don't think they should need reminding. <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I mean, this is why you know journalists need to be trained, yeah. and um, you know cannot simply be replaced by citizen journalists. And that's another whole that's discussion. A whole other discussion, yeah. <laughs>
Some questions. Um, this is mostly aimed at Kim, but um, I'd like to hear Taki's thoughts on it as well. Um, you both clarified how journalism PR is very, very different. But given that journalism is changing, um, do you think aspiring journalist students could benefit from working within PR to understand the new layer that is needed in terms of packaging their story, their stories for um, pu for print, basically, or The Guardian, to know what they want? How they so, I mean, a good example of that, of course, is um, students are encouraged increasingly to take internships or placements. I mean, they've done it in fashion and design for years. But I suppose the question, if I get it right, is, is it a good thing for, for students who are studying journalism to also get a feel for what it's like to be in a PR company or what it's like to be in a press and communications? Is that useful? I think it is. I mean, I, I did the reverse, actually. Uh, when I first went into PR, I spent... One of our clients was the independent. Tony O'Reilly was one of our, our benefactors, good pal of Brian Basham back in the day. These are names that probably passed you by. Uh, but anyway, these are the, the, the people who founded, you know, the great newspapers of our country. But uh, um, in essence, I spent two weeks um, on the floor of, of the independent. And uh, the first thing that I found... It, back then, the independent had a lot of staff. Um, they had at least 200 journalists. Um, and I found that it was a very quiet floor. And I learnt about the importance of speaking to the one journalist, not just sending an email <laughs> out to lots of journalists. Um, and I remember one, the education journalist, going like that into her phone, like this, because she didn't want her fellow education correspondent uh, to hear the story. And I thought, why are you treating each other like this? This is really odd. You're <laughs> colleagues. Uh, maybe it's just me being a bit naive, but uh, I think it was just me. But um, they were very protective about that story. And I learned a lot in those two weeks, and vice versa. Um, I think a lot of journalists, when they come into our place, it's, it's not just about spin. Yes, we do. I'm not here to promote the bad stuff about our borough. Um, I'm here to promote the good stuff, but also to explain why the bad stuff happens. Um, so, yes. Can you imagine if um, uh, next time you go into Taki's office, you know, he would say to you, like, yeah, I've got this, uh, you know, we want to talk to you. Uh, by the way, I've got at least three really big problems to tell you about. <laughs> just, I just thought I'd volunteer that. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah, we know that. We know that. Um, in answer to your question, I think, uh, I think it's a great thing to do. If you get the opportunity of an internship um, in a PR agency, uh, these are these are highly professional organisations. Now you will learn to write quickly and clearly. Um, you will learn how to uh, sell something to somebody on the telephone, um, and uh, that is an absolutely essential skill for a good journalist because you've got to sell your stories to the editors. Um, and you know, learning to do that in the 30 seconds, which is the most they will give you um, to to sell your story face to face or on the phone, is uh, is a good skill. Uh, and I mean, you know, I mean, researching. Uh, so I mean, they're very similar skills. Janet. Jackie, uh, one thing I, would, I was concerned about, although a lot of what you said I did agree with, is when you, your response to that person on the phone who was doing an investigation, and he said, "I want to talk to you because you're not affiliated with anybody." Now, most investigations these days are very difficult to do, and. As you said, mm. both of you, there's no money in the system to pay people to be on the phone speculatively trying to find a story. So a lot of this is happening by freelancers who don't have that affiliation. And I'm just a bit worried that you'd put the phone down on them, so I'm berating you for that. But yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, 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 I love the sound of my voice far too much. Um, no, it, it's, no we're, we're still in conversation. Um, what we're doing is something, look, come back to me with some questions. And in fact, I was knocking on his door. I knew he was operating in my patch. Um, he didn't know I knew. Um, and I called him. And uh, he, he, he dodged my call for a long, long time. And eventually I decided to go to one of his potential commissioning editors. Now, this is the dark arts here. And, uh, and I said, look, I hear your guy is in the area. I want to talk to him. I want to put our side. Um, on the other hand, I want to also make sure that he's abiding by the principles of your organisation and giving us a fair hearing and not going to give you a finished package without, with us only coming in at the end for the last two or three minutes. Um, so, and eventually, oh, lo and behold, uh, it went to the, uh, the commissioning editor and uh, within about an hour I got a call. 
Um, and, but that was his one potential commissioning editor. I, I know he's a freelancer. So no, we're not shutting the door. But I wanted to have some framework within which to, um, he's a top, top. Uh, you'll see it. It'll be, it'll be up before May and you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, I'd, I'd rather it wasn't happening, but um, it is happening. Um, and so what we'll be doing is we're waiting for his questions to come in. So we will be talking to him in fulsome terms. One last question, just behind Janet. You had your hand up, yes. Um, you said that there was a risk of checkbook journalism with PR and journalism working too closely together. In your experience, have you ever um, found this to be an issue in the past? Mm. Um, How many brown envelopes have you had? I mean, I, I, I'm, quite, I'm quite straight, actually, and uh, that's why I've made no money. Um, <laughs> but I know lots of people who have, I'm afraid, and in financial PR, um, it's very easy. In the old days, pre... What you used to do with share trading, for instance, there was a thing called the daily list, and every single share trade was listed in this book. And it was very, very difficult to spot insider trading. So people will go down to the pub, uh, journalists included, they don't go to the pub now because they're busy writing uh, for the 6,000 words a day. It's a, it's a hellish job being a journalist <laughs> these days, I think. Um, and, but the, in the old days, they could go down um, to the pub and you would swap stories. And I know of people who made money out of it um, and who would make, take action on the back of insider information. And there was a famous case, of course. Um, it was with the mirror, wasn't it? And, uh, it was, yes. And, uh, oh, yes, and yeah, that absolutely. He, was city traders, city slickers, city, city slickers, slickers they were called, and they were prosecuted for it. Mm -hmm. But I'm afraid I think that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, we, when we were in this financial PR company, I saw, um, I used to follow the big trades of companies that were merging. And you'd know the next day there was going to be a big merger. Um, you heard it on the grapevine. And yet there were share trades going the other way. And you knew, ah, maybe the, the trade wasn't quite as it seemed. Maybe the news wasn't good news. And yes, that drug would fa fail its phase three trials and the share price would plummet. Someone was selling when everyone else was buying. That was an insider trade. Was it investigated? No. The FSA didn't have the resources to do it. And you just multiply that across the piece. Um, and we know about some of these famous cases that are currently appearing now <laughs> and are currently before the courts. Well, of course, Kim, for us as BBC journalists, it was the bane of our lives very often that we would be chasing a story and chasing uh, subjects to animate that story and somebody else would get in there uh, with some cash and steal them away. So actually it is a very real problem. Not yeah, a problem yeah, for yeah, in terms of crime, yeah. Mm. yeah. I can remember, um, uh, uh, you, there, there are ways of circumnavigating that though. I can remember, I didn't do much court, which, so, which is why Duggan has been great fun. Um, as well as a privilege and all that sort of stuff, uh, she said, covering herself quickly. <laughs> um, there, there was there, there was a, a child protection issue, I think it was, and it was um, the family had been bought up by the Daily Mail, and um, they had their mail minder with them, who was ensuring that nobody was talking to the press. I mean, it, there's lots of milling about a court, and this is you know, as a journalist, you've just got to go and talk to people. Uh, it, 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 is, it is really about social skills and um, liking people and stri striking up conversations with people and um, just getting someone's trust quickly. And I, you know, did all this with the family, you know, while we were all milling around outside court so they knew my face and that sort of thing. Kneeling on my knees in front of the Royal Courts of Justice in that, um, you know, the, in the milling when they all come out and they can't say anything because the male minder is there and... and uh, and he's told them they can't say anything, otherwise they don't get their 25,000 quid or whatever it is. But I, 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 I you know, built up a little bit of a relationship in, in about five minutes, chat with the father on my knees. I just shot him a question, eye to eye, eye contact. He just naturally answered it. And he gave us 15 seconds that was enough for everybody. So there are ways around it. Um, I, 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 following on from the financial thing, I mean, that is really malign and evil. Um, but um, I, I don't think we should belittle um, just all the stuff, all the lifestyle stuff, fashion, um, makeup, holidays, um, all this stuff that journalists are writing about all the time, which is basically about the you know, The deal is the journalists get the free stuff and they write about it. And I think that's pretty corrupt, actually. I agree. I would never do it. And there are, uh, yeah, but there are thousands who do. On that note, of uh, corruption. Let me uh, thank Kim and Taki for giving up their time and sharing their insight and expertise on PR and journalism 
and the future happy relationship between the two. <laughs> Thank you.